Okay. All right. I think we're all here. I call for order the meeting of the Cleveland Heights University High School School District. Ms. Ms. Wright. Here. Josh. Here. Mr. Banks. Here. Ms. Sweeney. Jody Here. Oh. <laughs> gotcha, Miss Lewis. Here. Am I still frozen, or am I okay now? You're okay. Good. Okay. Just want to double check. Okay, so the first thing on our agenda is a resolution recommending OSBA. Um, amend its legislative platform. So do I have a motion to consider the um, resolution for OSB to amend its platform? So motioned. Second. Okay, I am going to go ahead and read the resolution. It is a long one again. Um, so would anybody want to jump in if I take a break at some point here? And, I'll be ready. and just so the public, okay, thank you. And just so the public who's watching this understands, um, we are a member of the Ohio School Boards Association, that's OSBA, and every year they put out a legislative platform, and I was reading it and felt that um, we should ask them to strengthen some of the language that they have in it. So therefore, I, uh, with the help of Dan Hines, drafted a um Resolution, thank you very much, Dan, for your help. And this is the resolution that's going to be before us tonight. So it's a resolution recommending amendment to the Ohio School Boards Association 2020 legislative platform. Whereas the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District is a member of the Ohio School Boards Association, OSBA, and whereas the OSBA advocates through a legislative platform that is reviewed and amended each year by OSBA member districts and Whereas the legislative, whereas the current legislative platform includes language related to vouchers, and whereas the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District and its local taxpayers have been in a disparate way harmed by Ed Choice voucher program, and go ahead, Dan. Whereas public school districts operate under a biased, test based accountability system that is inherently flawed and one which private and non-public schools who accept public money are not held to. And whereas research studies have shown a correlation between low scores on standardized tests and poverty. And whereas in fiscal year 2020, Ohio's public schools will have nearly $150 million hijacked from their state funding to be redirected to private non-public schools based on these test scores. And whereas teachers and administrators at non-public schools are not held to the same professional licensing requirements as they are in Ohio public schools. And whereas public school districts are audited by the state of Ohio annually and are subject to Ohio public record law. Jody? Now, therefore, be it resolved on June 2nd, 2020, the Cleveland Heights University Heights City Schools Board of Education recommends the following language be added to the legislative platform under the voucher plank. OSBA supports legislation that requires all vouchers to be funded in a way that does not deduct from or diminish funding to public school districts. OSBA supports legislation that places a cap on the amount of money a district can lose to vouchers. Now, therefore, be it resolved on June 2nd, 2020, the Cleveland Heights University Heights City Schools Boards of Education recommends the following language be added to the legislative platform under the public non-public school funding plank. OSBA supports legislation that requires all private non-public schools receiving public tax money to be held to the same accountability standards governing Ohio's public schools, including licensure requirements, and requires all non-public schools receiving public tax money 
to be subject to the same financial reporting, audit requirements, and sunshine laws as Ohio public schools. So is there any discussion about the um, resolution that's before us? Well, I think that we are asking in this resolution for the Ohio School Boards Association to be more vocal and more deliberate in uh, supporting public schools during this time when we're under attack by state legislature. And that should be their job. So I am in support of this particular resolution. Thank you. I want to make a note that um, in this next school year, we are expected to be losing $9 million of our funding through um, vouchers, and that that's $9 million that is not subject to sunshine laws. It's not subject to the same auditing requirements that we are under, and it's being managed by people who are not elected and cannot be voted in or out of office. So that was one of the reasons I felt it was very um, important that we um, ask OSBA to please strengthen their legislative platform. So what will happen, assuming, you know, if we pass this, this um, resolution tonight, it will go to the OSBA Legislative Committee and they will decide whether or not to include it. I, I'd like to say I'm pretty happy to see this and, and I'm certainly going to vote for it. Um, this is something that we've all been frustrated with, with the Ohio School Board Association, where they really haven't taken strong enough position on vouchers that I think we really wish that they did. And a lot of that has to do with it really hasn't affected a lot of public school buildings. You know, we're one of the uh, outliers, and actually we were one of the outliers. We're not anymore when you see schools like uh, Mayfield, um, Rexford, Brookview Heights, Solon get put on the Ed Choice list you know, because of the way the report card works. And we know that's flawed. Um, we know that Democratic and Republican lawmakers in Columbus have also said that the report card is flawed. Um, I think there's some videos going on that Adam Dew recently produced that you know, demonstrate that. And if you look at their testimony, you do hear what the legislators have, have actually said. And they've used the word flawed. Um, so I'm really supportive of this. So I'm you know, really thank you guys for putting it together. It's a it's really a good idea. And hopefully OSBA will take uh, another platform on this course. Well, and I think part of it is we need to be putting pressure on our own trade association to step up. And I think this is one of the ways that we can do it is by, you know, introducing um, <clears throat> language that we would like seen included in the legislative platform. I agree. I think Agreed. that, um, you know, as much as we have done in Columbus, uh, lobbying through the phone, going to Columbus and testifying, having some of our incredible students go to Columbus and testify. Um, yes, you know, Jim is right. Many of the legislators uh, who were there um, mentioned exactly that. The problem is that they say these words, that they recognize the problem, and then they do nothing. You know, we, uh, we were all down there in the middle of February, as were districts from all over the state. Shaker had a great contingent there. Um, and, um, and they acknowledged the flaws but then the resulting legislation was worse than we had been, than was even on the table at that moment. And so we need to, pr to put more pressure on the legislature to be more responsible. We need to advocate through as many different avenues as possible against this voucher catastrophe. Vouchers are hurting students. Vouchers are hurting our taxpayers vouchers are hurting our community. Everything that we can do to push back against vouchers is pushing back on behalf of our students out of respect for our taxpayers and out of appreciation to our community. So I absolutely support this. Yes, Any other comments? Oh, yeah, go ahead, I, 
I support it as well because I think um, OSVA should be more of an advocate for um, for for what for our district and what we're addressing. Okay, so I think we're ready to vote on this. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Face. Yes. Yes. Mr. Hush. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Ms. Freely? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Gaynor, if you will get that resolution, um, if, get the dates in it and get it down to OSBA, they need that um, in the next week or so in order to get it in front of their legislative committee. That are Will do. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yes. So, the next item on our agenda is awards and recognitions. So do I have a motion to do the awards and recognition? Motion. Second. All right. No motion for that. Oh, no motion for that. Okay, Liz, take it away. We will let you cover the awards and recognition. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I will give uh, Keith and Kavanaugh a moment to get our screen going, and we will start. Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for taking the time to join us here online tonight. I'd like to begin our virtual recognitions tonight by acknowledging a group of people who many of us have been fortunate to work alongside of for many, many years. As their time with us has come to a close, I want to thank each one of you for your dedication to our district. Our 2019-2020 retiring staff are Kevin A. G. CHUH School District, Karen Allen, Boulevard and Roxborough Elementary School, Mary Anderson, Cleveland Heights High School, Darlene Bolden, Board of Education, Ann Gilbert, Fairfax Elementary School, Beth Gabaiski, Noble Elementary School, Joy Henderson, Cleveland Heights High School, Paul Hungerford, Roxborough Middle School, Anthony Hurley, CHUH School District, Maria Johnson, Noble Elementary School, Valerie Joseph, Fairfax Elementary School, Joe Nicholas, Cleveland Heights High School, George Pelk, Garrity Professional Development School, Beth Ray, Noble Elementary School, Ryan Shaner, Cleveland Heights High School, Jane Samiri, Cleveland Heights High School, Emmett Spragans, Cleveland Heights High School, Linda Stephenson, Roxborough Elementary School, David Stewart, Heights High School, Linda Weiss, Roxborough Middle School, and Cynthia Wilson, Heights High School. Please know that your presence will truly be missed here at Cleveland Heights University Heights, and you will always be a part of the Tiger Nation family. Once a tiger, always a tiger. I wish you all an enjoyable and much deserved retirement. Next tonight, I am so proud to announce that every member, every member, of the Heights High School's varsity swim team senior class has received the academic All-America Award. This is a national award that recognizes graduating seniors who are varsity athletes with outstanding academic performances throughout their high school careers. Congratulations to Lainey Goslin, Abra Lizowski, Elena Rinaldi, Sylvia Snow Rackley, Hannah Teets, Jesse Titus. We wish you great success as you continue on in your swim careers. Additionally, the entire girls varsity swim team has been named an All-America Scholar Team. This award is bestowed upon varsity teams of 12 or more student athletes with a combined GPA that is among the highest in the country. Mm -hmm. Our team placed in the gold tier 
meaning they are ranked among the very top student athletes in the nation. Congratulations goes to Emma Adamo, Myron Alcorn, Helen Barr, Catherine Braverman, Patricia Chen, Claire Dolan, Lainey Goslin, Claire Hall, Abigail Loretic, Abra Lazowski, Fiona Mack, Harriet Nichols, Nora Reinhardt, Elena Rinaldi, Sylvia Snow Rackley, Hannah Teets, and Jesse Titus. And finally, we have our May Tiger Team Members of the Month. These Cleveland Heights University Heights staff members have been recognized by their peers and the community for going above and beyond to create and sustain a culture of excellence in our district. Even during this time apart, their efforts have affected our community in a positive way. From the Board of Education, Bus Depot and Milliken, Felicia Gould. From Boulevard Elementary School, Stacy Cohen. From Canterbury Elementary School, Jason Franklin. From Delisle Options Center, the entire IT department. Fairfax Elementary School, Carrie Jackson. From Garrity Professional Development School, Patrick McNichols. From Heights High School, Joe Nicholas and Jane Samiri. From Monticello Middle School, John Diligente. From Noble Elementary School, Paul Katkak. From Oxford Elementary School, Rebecca McCalligan. From Roxborough Elementary School, Grace Chen. And from Roxborough Middle School, Ryan Williams. Thank you for all you do and congratulations. This concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you, Liz. And now we're gonna move on to our statements from the audience. We did have one person who signed up, that is Gary Cantor. I'm gonna call Gary right now. Is this Gary? Hi, Gary, it's Jody Serini from the Cleveland Heights University Heights Board of Education. Are you ready to make your public comment? Uh, okay, give me a second because I got to put the phone on speaker, okay? So I'll tell you when to start. Okay, Gary, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, go ahead, you, you may start. I'm reading from uh, Cleveland.com. Uh, my article June 1st, 2020. The headline reads State Auditors Recommend Findings for Recovery over CHUH Levy Survey. A State Auditors Task Force recommends seeking recovery of roughly $35,000 in taxpayer money used by the Cleveland Heights University Heights Board of Education to fund a voter survey promoting passage of the March 17th school levy. Quote, even if we accept the district's position that it did not intend to have work performed in support of a levy campaign, this does not excuse the payment of $34,675 in public funds for such a result. The April 21 case closing memo from the Ohio Auditor Special Investigation Unit states. The recommendation to the State Auditor's Regional Office at the CHUA District, quote, should be actively pursuing repayment of these misspent, misspent funds, and quote, was forwarded May 29th to Gary Cantor, the Cleveland Heights resident who filed a taxpayer's complaint with the state in January. CHUA School Superintendent Liz Kirby declined comment that day saying the district had not, yet received, had not yet received an update from the Ohio Auditor's Office on the matter. 
with various district representatives involved in securing the contract with our strategy group, $6,000 for consulting, and Lake Research Partners, $28,275 for polling services. The auditor's task force saw no reason to prosecute anyone individually, or for that matter, any criminal prosecution at all. Cantor disagrees, saying the district is, quote, guilty as charged, end quote, and pointing to the fact that he brought up the issue of taxpayer-funded campaign polling with the previous administ school administration in 2016. Quote, however, the facts clearly support the issuance of a fining for recovery, end quote, the state auditor's task force reported concluded. The state's case closing memo notes on April, notes an April 15 letter from the Board of Education Council stating in part that, quote, district, district administrators were shocked that the analysis provided by the higher consultants was focused on the levy rather than the strategic planning. State auditors cite, quote, several facts which undermine the district's position. Beginning with polling that was geared at, quote, 500 likely March 2020 primary voters, end quote, as well as sample questions and references to a proposed, quote, 7.9 mil operating levy, end quote, that did wind up appearing as issue 26 on the ballot, where it lost by about 600 votes. Cantor has since asked CHUH school officials to outline any, quote, vital reform steps the district has taken or will take to prevent future abuse of taxpayer funds influencing public elections and cover-ups of this magnitude, end quote. State officials added that the district's defense might be more believable if it had sought to recover the money on its own. Now, that's the end of the article. I find it ironic that your, uh, your resolution to the OSBA refers to uh, uh, being audited subject to audits and uh, careful and, and, and custodials of, of this taxpayer's money. And we get this, which shows that's just talk. Thank you. All right. Next item on our agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to consider the consent agenda? So motion. <clears throat> Do I have a second? A second. Is there any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, Mr. Gaynor. No, yes. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Yes. Um, one of the things, you know, we always like to talk about the donation. And um, in this, uh, this uh, month's donation, I just really wanted to um, recognize Bialy's Bagels, uh, which is such a great um, generational, multi-generational business here in, in the school district. And, and uh, they donated their incredible product, uh, the bagels, to be included in the uh, grab-and-go lunches to the tune of about $500 worth. Um, which is such a wonderful expression of commitment to the community. Just wanted to re really publicly say thank you to the Ali's Bagels. Thank you, Dan. And I want to congratulate our retirees. I know we're voting yeah. on that tonight, but, um, you know, many of these people served our district for a long time. And I know this is not how they wanted to go out in a year where we were in the middle of COVID and they didn't get to finish out the school year with their kids. Um, in their buildings, in their classrooms. And I just wanted to say congratulations on the retirement. Thank you. And as Liz says, once a tiger, always a tiger. Um, feel free to stay in touch with us and come back and visit, uh, particularly if our buildings are open in the fall and, you know, have the opportunity to come and say goodbye to the kids. I think that would be amazing. Are there any other comments on the consent agenda? If not, then Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Sabini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Wright? Yes. 
Okay, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And under that, we have a reading of board policy 5460 graduation requirements. I think we'll um, vote on that first and then we'll let Liz give her, um, if she has additional comments. I want to make sure we don't forget to do the reading of the policy. So do I have a um, motion to consider? That's the first reading, so you're not voting on this one. Okay, we're not voting on it tonight. So we yeah. just have discussions about it. You got it. Yep. Thank you. And is, is um, there anybody else, Liz, who needs to address any questions on this? Any other staff member? Uh, Paul Lombardo is available. Okay. Yes, good evening, everyone. This is the uh, first reading of uh, the graduation requirements policy. There'll be two more after this. Um, so if you have any questions, you can, um, we can tackle them now or you can send them to me. You'll get this two more readings coming up. Paul or Dr. Lombardo, I didn't have any questions, but I did notice a couple of typos I had submitted. Did you get those? Uh, I did and the updated version is, is uh, in board docs now, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. I think it's worth pointing out, you know, we have this year a new set of graduation requirements that kind of is another example of the somewhat moving target that um, the, the folks in Columbus uh, give us that we have to continue to adapt to. Um, the class of 2021 and beyond, for instance, have a, a brand new um, requirement of fields that they have to meet. They have to, in addition to their their normal, if you will, or, or traditional work, they have to get a couple of seals. And, and these seals are, uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with them, but it's just something new yet again. Um, if I have a question, I think it would be, um, uh, Dr. Lombardo, do you know, um, there's discussion in Columbus about reducing the um, the state mandated and of course exams. Uh, is that likely to to impact these? Will we likely see a change in this in the event that that does pass the Ohio Senate? Um, I am not aware. Um, um, I am not aware of anything about that, Dan. Well, I know that typically. I would assume that that, was, that will be some guidance that they would revise for us as they revise this year as it relates to the graduation re requirements. We are certainly hopeful but that that legislation that is out there now will provide for end of course exams, given that they create an unnecessary and unhelpful burden to uh, the number of tests that students have to take and that teachers have to administer in the high school. So we're hopeful that we see those changes and will certainly update this policy to reflect that as directed by ODE. And I'd like to make a statement just um, in the same vein that Dan you know, mentioned that we keep, you know, the state of Ohio keeps changing the graduation requirements and I know I was at a meeting because my son will be affected by these new rules. And it was a meeting with parents and it was very confusing for parents who have older children who had different sets of requirements and trying to follow as each graduating year has different requirements. If you have multiple kids, it's very, very confusing as to which kid has to meet what requirements. So I just wanted to make that statement that, you know, it, it's, it's just difficult for parents. And I know it's not, you know, it's not us, it's the state, but it, the state is making it very confusing and difficult for parents to follow all the changes. Mm -hmm. So any other discussion? If not, then we will be um, seeing the next reading at the next regular meeting in July, right? Yes, thank you very much. All right, Liz, did you wanna add anything to the superintendent's report? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, I first want to just start out by celebrating all of our staff, teachers, staff members, principals, and Board of Education personnel for their hard work this year. We have concluded the 
2019-2020 school year, the last day of school for students, was this past Friday. It has definitely been a shift. It has definitely been an opportunity for all of us to grow, and I really have appreciated how quickly people have adapted their ways and their practices in order to support students. And some of the things that we have observed during this time period has not only been the implementation of online learning, but I have remained inspired by how staff have really gone above and beyond to support students and to provide a bit of social emotional support and relief during these times. That's everything from the yard signs that both staff and board member or board member ordered and passed out to students. We've done promotion, uh, promotion yard sign ceremonies with students who are rising middle school students, students that are rising high school students, for students that are graduating, for students that are inductees in the National Honor Society at the high school. It's just been really great seeing in the community all the students who are connected to our schools and the families that are connected to our schools and all the folks who are happy to celebrate students during this time. You know, if you've been watching social media, you've seen all types of videos, you've seen songs, you've seen poems, you've seen statements, you've seen morning announcements, you've seen artwork, you've seen commercials. So all of us have developed you know, lots of technical skills as a result of this the season that we've been in. And again, all of this has been in service of our families and our students really trying to connect with them and really trying to make sure that they're okay during this time. So I want to say to the staff, I know we are in really, really challenging times. And if we keep working together, if we continue to stay creative, if we keep really looking at what we are preparing our students for and using what's in the best interest of our students to guide our work, we will continue to achieve our goals and provide the best educational holistic experience for our students in the district. So I wanna thank you all for that. I wanna thank the board members who have been enthusiastically participating in anything and everything that uh, we, have, we have offered the opportunity for you guys to join in. There's just been such great enthusiasm on your part we know next week we will have a week-long, the first ever week-long graduation, I'm sure, in the history of Cleveland Heights High School. Mm -hmm. It's history in Cleveland Heights High School, but we will be making it next week. So we will have about 80 students coming in a day to have their own individual graduation ceremonies. And each board member, you guys have enthusiastically agreed to give your entire day, some folks multiple days, to share that experience and to celebrate with students as well. So thank you for that. We're looking forward to that. I have to give a shout out to the high school admin team who really have listened to lots of feedback on graduation and have made adjustments and have uh, submitted a schedule for approval to our Board of Health and have kept the engine moving. Special shout out to Jane Samiri who is leading these efforts. She's leading to get the kids graduated um, and all those things as well. And I have to say the students have been also very active and advocates on what they want to see in their graduation. So I have received outreach from them via Instagram, email, <laughs> through uh, parents about what they want their experience to be. And I love it. And we have listened to what you guys have said you wanted. Um, and so I'm looking forward to looking forward to next week. We did close out the grading period at the beginning of this week, and we will be assessing where students are as relates to achievement over quarter three and quarter four, knowing that it's been a unique time. But we want to see where students are in terms of their performance and what kinds of supports we'll need to provide for them when they come back next year. We have also uh, concluded the cleanup and clean out process at all schools. So again, a shout out to Felicia Gould and the Ed Services team for not only the distance learning component, but also the technical component of closing school out that we also have had to manage. So thank you for organizing that. That's why she's a Tiger Team member of the month of May for sure. In terms of um, the work of our operations teams, it's hard to think that we, that we aren't in school given the, the work that's happening at our buildings under George Petcat's leadership. Um, so we are continuing with our um, building improvement and some of the planned renovation projects that we've had in the works and that work is going really, really well. 
From a meal service perspective, as of today, we have served 245,260 meals um, to, to family. So that is as of today, 245,260 meals to family. We can't say enough about ABI and how they have partnered with us. And I have observed the process of this meal distribution and the types of meals that are being um, that are being prepared, and they really are high quality, great food, fresh food being prepared daily for for our families. We also are very lucky in that uh, Ted Copeland, who is a parent of one of our staff members, owns Perfect Pact, and they are a company that received a grant from the USDA to make our district a site for the Farmers to Families program. So we're partnering through them with Farmers to Families. And between um, starting last week, every Thursday from 11 to 1 p.m. at Heights High School, we are distributing um, we are distributing boxes of food to, food to anyone who would like uh, that food. So all you have to do is pull up, pop your trunk 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 open, and uh, someone from our team is helping to distribute uh, that food. So we were happy to partner. Our staff was happy to jump in and provide this um, service to, to families as well. We also are working on having a, um, um, a site in the Noble neighborhood for those families that do not have cars that also uh, would like to take advantage of the free produce opportunity as well. So special thanks to George Petkak and Nancy Pepler who have taken this opportunity and quickly built out a whole drop off process. Also Gary Kaserman at the high school as well well, the work of, of, of Gary and his team. Um, and so that concludes my, my report for tonight. We will be launching, one more thing, I guess I'm not concluded. We will be launching our advisory task, our advisory work group on reopening this Thursday. And at our first meeting, we will be looking at some draft plans on the operational side and the educational side for our return to school in the fall. There is uh, ongoing information coming out from the from the Department of Education and from the governor's office. And so as that guidance comes out, we will incorporate that into, into our reopening. We are still waiting on the state of Ohio's guide and reopening plan to schools. I uh, thought we would have it by now, but there's a bit of a delay with everything else going on. But we will still start that process with the advisory board group this Thursday. That concludes my report. Thank you, Liz. The next item on our agenda is the board president's report. And I was just gonna report that uh, I attended another um, Northeastern Ohio School Board's president's meeting last Wednesday. And mainly we talked about things that we were doing for graduates. And it seems like most of the school districts were doing a lot of the same things as far as the signs in the yards, trying to do a safe social distancing um, graduation ceremony. So kids did to get some kind of ceremony that they could participate in. Um, there was a little bit of discussion about um, some parades and, you know, splicing together the videos of graduations and showing them at movie theaters at, you know, a drive-in theater. A couple of people, a couple of school districts have been able to schedule that, a couple I haven't, a couple still trying to figure it out. Um, there is also some discussion about opening fields and um, sports facilities. It seems like everybody um, is taking that pretty slowly and cautiously making sure that they're following all the rules and you know, waiting for some additional guidance on that. Um, I know Beachwood had put out a notice that they were opening their fields, but they um, made a point to make sure that they said that if um, social distancing wasn't followed, that they would close things immediately again. And lastly, I wanted to point out to everyone that Chagrin Falls City Schools tomorrow, so that's um, Wednesday, June 3rd, is having a guest speaker at their meeting, and it's Anthony Fazacheca from um, Cleveland State, and he's going to be talking about um, economic conditions and um, just kind of the climate of considering um, what's on the levy and things, or, uh, you know, levies on the ballot and, and some other issues like that. Sounds like that's pretty interesting. That will be live streamed on um, Chagrin Falls' YouTube channel. I believe it's 7 o'clock is when their meetings are. Um, so we continue to meet as a group. I'm finding it um, very, very useful. There's a lot of good information, a lot of um, interesting information being shared. And if I can't make it, I will reach out to another member to attend in my um, behalf because that's um, how we've been operating as a group, that if the president can't make it, 
um, we can invite another board member to call in and, and we're doing this over Zoom, so it's very convenient right now. So I just wanted to give everybody an update on that meeting and, and that, that group meets every other week. So are there any board committee reports? Jody, before you get there, we have a five-year forecast. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I totally skipped that. I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. I'm sorry. I'm a little disorganized um, tonight. My sister had surgery today, and it's been a very tough day. So um, we do have to consider the five-year forecast. So if um, do I have a motion to consider the five-year forecast? A motion we consider the five-year forecast. Do I have a, a second? second? All right, do we have any discussion on the five-year forecast? Or Mr. Gaynor, do you want to cover some of the assumptions and information for us? I do. So um, you'll notice this forecast is labeled June number one because there will be a June number two. So, um, you know, as, as we mentioned previously, there's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of big changes that are happening pretty rapidly with the forecast. So you're going to see it multiple times probably over the next few months. Uh, the only change in this forecast from the previous one that you passed is really a result of some conversation in the Life Finance Committee that met last week. Um, we met, the, uh, the committee reviewed the forecast, asked a lot of good questions. One of the questions they asked was, well, you know, I, I had highlighted a, um, a second workers' comp refund, you'll remember, um, due to COVID-19 that happened. Well, I, I highlighted that, but uh, the um, receipt hasn't made its way in the forecast. So, uh, so the only change in the forecast uh, this month is that your miscellaneous local receipts uh, has been increased by the amount of that second um, workers' compensation refund. So uh, I did want to get that in as soon as possible. Now, I did look at the Ed Choice numbers today, uh, but I did to make that change for tonight's forecast um, uh, so soon, but you're going to see at the next uh, five-year forecast uh, at the special meeting this month that, as Jody mentioned earlier in the meeting, you know, what we previously forecasted as $8.5 million in Ed Choice vouchers is now just over $9 million. So I think it's $9 million and $600. Um, so that's going to be an increase you'll see in the next one. Uh, the Lay Finance Committee also asked some good questions about uh, property tax assumptions, um, about the trend for Peterson and autism scholarships. Uh, they talked a little bit about, um, again, the uh, choice vouchers, and we knew that was there was some uncertainty there. Uh, and also, you know, about the purchase orders and closing those that we know is still something that we're trying to get done this month and one of the reasons that we wanted to move the special meeting back a week. So, um, so that's an update on the forecast. Uh, it's Lots of moving parts still, but we're, um, as things are becoming known, we're, we're making the changes. And hopefully you're going to see uh, by uh, by the next forecast that you see quite a few changes. But, that, you know, that should be, we'll be ending the year with that forecast with everything we possibly know at that time. Hey, Scott, when you talk about uh, the special meeting, you're talking about the work session? That's correct, Yeah. Yeah. And that's on the is that a, that's on the twenty third. Twenty. Uh, well, there was an issue with the twenty third, so we were asking for it to be moved to the twenty fourth. Okay. Yeah. And the issue with it being on the twenty fourth. No. Uh, about the choice number, are you just going to put in what the current um, expenditure is going to be next year? I will. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have sort of an open enrollment through all summer. There is. There's going to be. It's going to open back up, and so that's a good point, Jim. I, I um, you know, I, I we'll have some conversation with uh, Liz. Had asked for Pat Christofferson and Sharon Roller to kind of dig up into the numbers of the current applications to see what's there, and kind of assess, I guess, as best we can whether that looks like. The majority of it, or we may have to build in a little extra uh, into that, and, and this, you know, we may see some additional applications over the course of the year. It's entirely, entirely possible. Okay. And I'd like to point out that that um, additional open enrollment that's happening is an interpretation by ODE. That was not in the original bill that was passed by 
the Ohio legislature. That's correct. Yeah, we need to remember that um, because it's this window which opens and never closes. And that's very different from how the voucher, sorry, how the voucher application process has happened in the past. Right. So um, I, I had a, a question, Scott. We just recently lost uh, about 1.4 million due to the COVID-19, uh, the effect of COVID-19 on the state's economy. We know that we're going to um, be getting another hit from next year's funding. Um, we don't know what that number will be, but we're assuming it's gonna be around the same number, I think. Um, is that included in your assumptions? Uh, we have, I see that we're, um, predicted to finish fiscal year 21 uh, with uh, basically a $2 million, $2 million in the, in the black. Um, that's cutting it pretty close though. If it's, if it's much more than that, plus we lose some more money to vouchers. Um, we are, we are looking like uh, we are tight and I'm wondering if um, more cuts might, might be necessary to be honest with you well i think that um you know that's a good point dan we're i i am working with you know i worked with sue party yesterday because we're offsetting those state cuts with the cares money that we're getting from the feds that's flowing through the state so there's an application process that you have to go through so we've kind of fast tracked that hoping that we can get that money in before the end of this fiscal year um, to kind of offset some of that. So that's assumed here. Um, and then we're also trying to, trying to make sure the state in their, in their, you know, very generous way has agreed that, that because we don't have enough foundation left for them to take this year, uh, because they made that cut so late in the school year, that they would be willing to take that cut next next fiscal year. So, so we're just working on some timing issues and some cash flow things to make sure that that's not an issue. But, um, and again, uh, closing the purchase orders that we're trying to close, we expect to grab some, some general fund uh, budget money back through that process. So I think we're, uh, we're good. We're good, but it's, you're right. It's very, it's very tight when you think that that's that, the, that amount in fiscal 21 doesn't even cover a single payroll, a single biweekly payroll. That's, scary position to be in and man, not one that we're you know, not happy to be in unexpectedly at the last minute based on ed choice changes and state cut changes it's, it's not been good. i think i think in terms of cash flow we'll be okay but we to your point may yet have to revisit some additional cuts as we go thank you for the clarification Scott. absolutely any other discussion on the, the uh, five-year forecast? If not, then uh, Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Friday. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rooney. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Lewis. Yes. All right, I already covered the board presence report. So now we're on to board committee reports. Do we have any board committee reports? The uh, advocacy task force met, um, gosh, it's, I'm losing my days last week. Um, and it was uh, a very good meeting. We, um, we discussed a, a number of topics. Uh, you know, a uh, great group of people. We had an incredible presentation by a, a Cleveland Heights resident uh, around um, some of the demographics of our, um, of our, of the city of Cleveland Heights, but also some of University Heights. Very informative, really, I think the most informative meeting, I think, uh, that I've been to from the task force in quite a while. Very worthwhile. Um, and the uh, Heights uh, Schools Foundation has a meeting um, coming up uh, next week, actually. 
Okay. Any the, other board um, committees? Yes, the lay finance committee met um, was it last week. It was last week. Last week. Um, they're going to have two more meetings before we meet for our July meeting. Um, they are digging through the five-year forecast. They've given Scott some things to look at. They're actually looking at two things. Um, one, you know, I think we, I don't know if we've made it clear, but we're indecisive about a school levy issue, about putting a school levy on the ballot in November. Um, I think we've, in previous conversations we have all mentioned, I mean, we as board members have talked about that. If we were to go on the ballot, we need to be prepared. So the lay finance committee is doing some homework to see uh, what kind of millage would need to be um, looked at uh, and possibly what kind of cuts would be necessary in order to um, put a levy on in November. Um, they also are going to look at an income tax increase as an alternative um, I'm not sure where that's going to go. Initially, um, a couple of the members who had been on the committee before that have looked at that in the past. The feeling was they didn't feel like it would be a good idea. Um, but they're going to look at it and come back to us with, with some recommendations. So essentially two meetings between now and when we meet in July. Um, and I'll get with Jody to see if we actually need to have an agenda item to uh, add to our July meeting uh, to invite them to uh, give us some findings. That I have to say. Thank you. Jody, um, just uh, on the general topic of, of uh, task forces and committees, we had a um, member of the community inquire about task forces and communities uh, and committees. Um, and so it, it might make sense um, to now to, to um, just say that we are incredibly blessed to have such a generous community with their time and expertise. We have task forces that will, that inform us um, about a number of topics from finance to uh, facilities to advocacy, early childhood education, um, the list goes on, and um, we always uh, we regularly post openings for participation on those many task forces and committees. Um, we're open to everyone in the community. It is a commitment of time. It, it must be said, and there is no pay for it other than the appreciation of your neighbors. So um, we're we're very grateful to those members of our community who are willing to share their incredible knowledge. Just thought it would be a good time to talk, to say that. Thank you, Dan. And yeah, th those are always posted on our website when we're um, forming a committee or trying to replace people who have stepped off of committees and we need to refill those positions. And you're right, nobody gets paid for it. It's all volunteer work and we greatly appreciate the residents and the you know, our neighbors and friends and community members who choose to serve on those committees. I know many of us have served on those committees um, before we ended up in these seats. You know, maybe, um, maybe we should find a way to recognize the members of our many task forces and committees because other, I mean, it is really a thankless job and, um, Perhaps that's, that's we, we could find some small way to recognize them with, uh, you know, with the other recognitions, for instance, just just thinking. That and giving them more chocolate, I think, would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up. I mean, all of our um, policies and procedures about how members are appointed to these committees, how we approach these committees, um, is all public, is all our policies. And, you know, we put in these every year. We've recently updated, well, not recently, maybe two years ago, we adjusted, it was longer than that, um, we adjusted how um, the policies actually work, you know, separating into task forces and board level committees. Um, so I would, you know, people are really curious, 
they sh they should look there too. Any other board committee reports? This is not exactly a committee, but um, I represent the board at the Reaching Heights Board of Director meetings, and um, Reaching Heights was able to hold a virtual version of its spelling bee, and it was fascinating because the setup allowed the audience to hear the team members work their way through the spelling of a word, which you don't usually have access to in the standard uh, spelling bee setup. And it was so cool to hear people figuring out like, okay, maybe this one's Greek and we've got to use a Q or wh whatever it was that was going on during the, the negotiations amongst the team members via Zoom. Um, and I wanted to congratulate Reaching Heights for being able to transfer their event to a separate format and for being able to make it such a wonderful event yet again. Excellent. And I want to add that the library won and <laughs> they are some outstanding spellers. Very impressive actually. Don't they always win? Yeah. yeah. Oh. The Dewey yes. Decimator. Yeah. <laughs> Very fun. So are there any other board committee reports? If not, is there any unfinished business? Is there any new business? The uh, agenda item regarding the, oh, okay. So I, I was looking at the public library budget. That was under the consent agenda. So yep, that was on the consent agenda. And then, this is not technically business, um, but Liz, your letter to the community from last week um, has made a tremendous impact. I have received a lot of feedback about your letter, and I think that people were very appreciative that you made a statement from the position of superintendent of schools about how this is affecting our students and how we as a society need to make life better for all of our kids. People are really, people paid attention to that. It was very important. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I don't want to make any kind of connections, but a neighboring community's school was um, really graffitied up pretty bad. And the principal had some really remarkable things to say but I just so wonder if your email is not, well, your, your notice to the community put our community at ease um, and we didn't see that level of um, graffiti um, and vandalism uh, at our properties. Um, and I kind of think there's some correlation with that. I mean, I think you really, you spoke from the heart. I mean, you obviously didn't speak for all of us, but I think most of us really agree with everything that you say. Um, but I was really proud to see it. And I do think it sort of kept a lot of the vandalism and the graffiti um, off of our buildings. Um, I know that's not why you wrote it, um, but thank you. Yeah, I, one thing I would say was, yeah, I'm, I'm so worried about what our children are experiencing right now. And, um, and it, I'm so glad that, you know, the underlying issue that really drives all of this, you know, the institutional racism and the ugly history of our country is something that we're committed to as a district, we're committed to dismantling. So, um, and it just reminds us of how important important that is. I will also say that the first ring superintendents put out a statement today, um, also denouncing the um, what has been happening to uh, black people, unarmed black people, at the hands of, of police as well. Um, and just all over the country, you know, people across public, the public and private sector, people are standing up and raising their voice. So, you know, I. 
I just hope things get better. Um, I'm excited to really continue the equity work here because that's the work that matters for our students. And it's the decisions we make every day that will impact the lives that they lead as they leave our schools. Absolutely. Thank you, Liz. I, I've gotten a lot of good comments on that. And I think the community just appreciated hearing from you and hearing from us. I think it was really important to have a leadership, you know, have a leader step out in front and, and speak from the heart. So thank you. Are there any correspondence and announcements? If not, then um, do I have a motion to adjourn into an executive session pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22G3 to meet with board legal counsel to discuss disputes involving the board and or the school district that are subject of pending or imminent court action and pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22G1 for the purpose of considering the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, demotion, or compensation of an employee or official of the school district. So Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? You're on mute, Scott. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Ray. Yes. Mr. Bosch? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Okay, so we're going to hang up from this meeting. We're going to rejoin the other link to um, go into our executive session, and then we will come back to this um, main link for open session to adjourn the meeting at the end of the evening. I have a motion to adjourn. Motion. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Your mic is off. Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Bosch? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. All right. We're adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Sorry. Good night. See you guys.